It's easy to assume that an adaptation can go horribly wrong. It's more than just changing names and having original footage, it's about knowing your audience while also respecting the source material, which is one reason how Power Rangers became so popular. It gave the Western audience stories that they can enjoy while using action scenes from a popular Japanese show called Super Sentai. This formula became successful for Haim Saban, the man behind Power Rangers, so he decided to do the same with Kamen Rider, another popular Japanese show about costume men beating up other costume men. However, this adaptation called Saban's Mass Rider was a train wreck. In fact, it was so bad that Toei, the owners of the Kamen Rider name, never allowed Saban to touch Kamen Rider ever again. That was back in the 90s, jump to 2008 and we get a new story. The Wang brothers tried their hand at adapting another Kamen Rider show. Toei was more reluctant this time, but the brothers seemed to know what they were doing, at least more than Saban. For one, the brothers' adaptation would stray as far from Saban's as possible. The new adaptation would keep the Kamen Rider name instead of Masked Rider. The show would be more serious in tone rather than have the goofy antics that Saban's Masked Rider was going for. The Wang brothers chose to adapt Kamen Rider Ryuki, a show about 13 Kamen Riders who are at war with each other with the lone winner being granted a wish for whatever they desire. It was a darker show that brought new ideas to the long-running series, which seemed fit for an adaptation. With the okay from Toei and with help from Adnus Entertainment, the Wang brothers began work on Kamen Rider Dragon Knight. We start with Mirror Noise. This sound means that a portal has opened, and someone needs help. A woman is about to enter her car, but some monsters from a mirror start to grab her. Then, Batman comes out of reflection, fights out the monsters, and some rather impressive fight scenes. Okay, so it's not Batman. The armored hero is called a Kamen Rider. More specifically, this rider is called Kamen Rider Wing Knight, and his suit is awesome. It's clearly going for a knight mixed with a bat, and it works rather well. Wing Knight then summons a sword using a card. Sword One thing that Dragon had adapted from Ryuki are the sounds at play when a weapon or attack is used. Ryuki has also had a plain voice, so I didn't expect anything else from Dragon Knight. It's passable and not annoying at the very least. Batman unmorphs and reveals a Matrix cosplayer. He helps the woman up and hears mirror noise. He leaves and rides off into the night. Cue theme song. Well, it's not the absolute worst thing I've ever heard. Again, it's passable since it's hard rock with some catchy guitar. I'm sure this song can pump up people for the action ahead. Other than that, it's not like I would put this song into my iPod or anything. Are iPods still a thing anymore? Man, I'm old. At a police station, we see a dad talking to his son. The boy, named Kit Taylor, apparently stole something, but he wakes up. The exposition officer says that Kit turns 18 today, so it's time for him to leave his foster home, but for now, he's let off with a warning. Kid is about to leave until he sees his dad, named Frank, in a reflection. Kid's dad tells him to search for the dragon. Kid enters his new home, well, it's actually his old apartment where he used to live with his dad. Kid picks up a picture frame and notices a small black box on a counter. Inside it are some cards. One of the cards says Advent. He then hears mirror noise and stands outside. A red dragon comes out of a reflective surface and seems like it's about to attack, but the dragon disappears, leaving Kit with a headache. At a bookstore, a young woman named Maya says that more people have been disappearing. Her friend, Trent, says that it's nothing but a conspiracy, although Maya also says that some mass vigilantes are connected to the disappearances. Another one of Maya's friends, named Lacey, stops by the store to scoff at Maya for still believing in those stories. However, Maya's gonna prove her wrong and she goes out to find her big scoop on the mask vigilantes. In an alleyway. Yeah, I'm sure she'll find something there, like Batman's parents. Actually, monsters find her first. Kit sees the monsters and tells her to get away. Turns out that Kit is the only person that can see the monsters as Maya just sees Kit kicking the air. Maya begins to walk away, but a monster drags her into a mirror. After being in another dimension, Maya is able to see the monsters. Kit continues fighting, but our Matrix cosplayer comes out of the mirror while holding Maya. Since his name isn't going to be said for another three episodes, I'll just say it now. Wing Knight's real name is Len. Fun fact, Len's counterpart in Conrad Ryuki is called Ren, with an R, for real creative. Len says that Kit has something that belongs to him. Kit runs away. Kit notices the giant spider in a mirror and takes a step back, but he gets sucked into a car. Kit falls through this dimension and gains gray armor. He wakes up and takes in his surroundings, but the spider's there waiting for him. Len noticed Kit go through the car, so now, it's time. Common Rider. First, that transformation is so cool, even if it is a little flashy. Second, is something that a lot of people in the Kamen Rider fanbase seem to really be up in arms over. To transform, Lin shouts the phrase, Kamen Rider. 
Believe it or not, I've seen comments on forums and videos saying that Dragonite is automatically a worse show than Ryuki simply because they shout Kamen Rider. Yet, people are okay with a weirder phrase like it's Morphin Time? I don't understand the fan base sometimes. Len defeats the spider, but then the red dragon from earlier starts attacking. To escape, Len says that they enter any window or reflective surface. Back in our world, Kit tries to ask Len some questions, but it seems like their time is cut short as they hear mirror noise and go back into the mirror. I say try because Kit tries to transform, but nothing happens. Common Rider! Common Rider! Common Rider? Go! Go! Go, Web, go! Kit then hears the dragon and looks at a card that says contract. He stands on the edge of a building, holding out the card. Len yells for him to stop, but the dragon enters the contract card making Kit's gray armor into red armor, officially making Kit into Kamen Rider Dragon Knight. I may be in the minority here, but I'm really liking the Dragon Knight suit. I thought the suits for this season were really boring at first, but they really started to grow on me, especially Dragon Knights. His suit is just that, a knight with a dragon motif, and I think it works. What else I like about the suits is that they have a sort of uniform look to them as they start to notice round enclaves on the legs and such, but they still stand out by color and details that are added. Maya says that she writes for a blog and believes that Kit's dad's disappearance has something to do with the world inside the mirrors. They both hear mirror noise. I'm assuming Maya can hear the noise now that she's been inside the other world before. They both go outside and Kit shows her that he can transform. Kit fights a crab-like monster but a bike appears, this time with another common rider that isn't Len. Kit is grateful that another rider is here but the new rider starts attacking Kit. This is common rider incisor, my least favorite of the suits. It's supposed to be a crab, but it's so bulky and honestly, just plain ugly. Of course, that's just my opinion since I know at least one person who really likes a suit. Poor guy. Kit and Incisor fight with Kit ending up escaping. The person under the Incisor armor, Richie, calls up someone to complain about not being a great fighter. The man on the other side reminds Richie of the deal he made. We see in a flashback that Richie's dad wants him to get a real job. At least, that's what this man named Connors said. Connors gave Richie an offer in the form of a deck with the symbol of a crab. Maya wrote in her blog about the mirror monster, so she gets a message from someone who calls themselves JTC. JTC has a blog that just so happens to have pictures of the mirror monsters. Kit goes to see Maya, but Incisor waits outside for a fight. Kit and Richie do end up fighting, where we find out that Richie will receive a million dollars for every common Rider he takes out. Len arrives to help, so Richie leaves. Len then explains what's really going on. The common Riders are protectors of Ventara, the world on the other side of the mirror. Ventara is a world that's exactly like our own, down to having the exact same people, but these people have different personalities and such. The black boxes, known as Advent decks, were stolen from Ventara and given to specific people on Earth. Kit needs the deck to protect himself from the other Riders. 12 in total. Other writers are going to fight Kit because they're going to think that Kit is working with Len. Back to Maya real quick. She gets an email from an editor saying that since Maya's been doing such a good job, she gets the opportunity to work with a well-known blogger named Michelle Walsh. After defeating a mirror monster, Richie stands on stairs above Kit and Len. Kit wants to fight, but Len says that it's going to be a one-on-one. -on -one. The two are going to end the fight with the final vent, basically what writers use as their finishers. They attack and Richie notices that his advent beast is disappearing along with Richie himself. Len picks up the Incisor deck, leaving Kit speechless. Len explains that Incisor got vented, meaning that Richie is sent to the Advent Void, a place between Earth and Ventara that no one can escape from. Richie won't come back. Some fates are worse than death. Sure, people in Ryuki straight up die instead of being vented, but being stuck in a void for all eternity, well, you can believe what you want. We see a green Kamen Rider step out of Ventara, this young man named Drew talks to who we think is Connors, but Drew calls him General. In a cool looking fortress, we see Connors talking to Drew, except Connors is just a fake name. His real name is General Xaviax. His plan is to kidnap every human on Earth to create an army, just like he did with Ventara. If Drew helps, he'll become a general in said army. We also learn that the Advent decks only work with the DNA that they're tied to. I said earlier that Ventara has the same people from Earth, which means that a Ventaran Common Rider has the same DNA as their twin on Earth. Kit and Len both don't know how to feel. Kit just saw someone disappear who may never come back and it's the first time Len ever vented someone. Kit wants out of being a writer, but he can't anymore since he contracted the dragon, something that Len warned him about. They both hear mirror noise so Len shows Kit a new trick, turning their motorcycles into brand new toys. Then they fight mirror monsters. 
These pinkish ones are the common mooks for this season. I like them. They look like a more futuristic evolution of putties. There's more detail to them, and they do look a little bit menacing. They're what I like about mooks. Generally simple with just a little bit of detail that really makes them memorable. Plus, Ryuki didn't exactly have mooks, so this is a nice change of pace. After defeating the mooks, Len sees a black monster in the mirror. Len tries to run after it, but the monster blocks off the entrance. Len explains that they just saw General Xaviax in his monster form. Which looks absolutely terrifying, by the way. To add on to earlier's exposition, Len says that Kamen Riders defeated Xaviax before, but there was a traitor who stole the advent decks for him. Xaviax was able to vent all of Antaran Riders except for Len. Now that Xaviax has the decks, he's given them to people like Richie in hopes that they would work for him. Len's mission is to get the decks back and vent the people who have them. Kid understands and wants to help. It's what his dad would have wanted. Kid gets attacked by the green Kamen Rider I brought up earlier. This is Kamen Rider Torque. It's one of my favorite designs of the season. Aside from green being my favorite color, I like how futuristic it looks despite still keeping the uniform design of the other suits. It also has a bit of a steampunk look, which I generally like. Kid tries to persuade the Rider to work together with Len, but Torque scoffs and unmorphs. Drew says that Len was the one who stole the advent deck for Xaviax. Drew was there when Len vented the original Dragon Knight. Drew is able to trick Kid into believing him by pulling off this stunt with Xaviax. Yeah, it's weird and we all know that Kid is gonna feel dumb for believing it later, blah blah blah. But for now, Kid and Drew are friends until further notice. JTC gives Maya a tip about sleepwalkers in a hospital. They're people who act like zombies, almost as if they came out of a UFO. Or a mirror. Trent and Maya investigate and find out that it's true. These people are mindless zombies and among them is Frank, Kid's dad. Maya returns to the hospital with Kit and Drew. Drew says that the people are acting this way because Xaviax drained them and the only way to return them to normal is to defeat Xaviax himself. Kit and Len meet up later with Kit saying that Frank was found and Xaviax has a cure. Len says that there is no cure anymore. There used to be a man who knew the cure, but he is no longer with us. Kit still doesn't believe Len, so Kit walks away. Just in time for Len and Drew to fight. Drew reveals that his motive to ally himself with Xaviax is to be the man on top, the man with the power to take over the world. And that's it. We see two men sparring in what looks to be a kind of fight club. The winner takes out a piece of metal from under his boxing glove. This man is called a cheater, but his real name is Grant. Xaviax, under disguise again, offers Grant a chance to be the best fighter on two worlds. Grant accepts and takes a green deck with the symbol of a chameleon. Grant's first opponent is Wing Knight. Drew and Kid see Len fight a mere monster, so Drew thinks of an idea to vent Len. But they run into Grant. Grant wants to fight Len alone, but first he's gonna have to deal with Drew. Grant transforms into Kamen Rider Camo, another one of my favorite suits. It's the most simple aside from Dragonite, but I love how you can tell it's a chameleon just by looking at its size, and it's green. Fun fact, what you see of Camo is 100% original footage. Then Len gets blindsided by a gray Kamen Rider. This is Kamen Rider Thrust, a rhino-based rider that looks... alright. I like how he uses cards by putting them in his shoulder piece. And he's gray, which is cool sometimes. The new writer tells Len about fighting to win the Battle Club tournament. Len tries to say that there is no such thing as Battle Club and whoever offered the winnings isn't telling the truth, but they continue fighting anyway. Grant, Drew, and Len watch, but Grant wants to fight Drew. Kid starts to realize that Grant has been lied to, just like Incisor. Everyone Xaviax has been involved with has offered them some kind of reward to defeat Len, including Drew. Grant tries to escape, but Drew readies an attack and makes Grant disappear. Thrust asks Len what just happened. Len says that Grant is gone forever. By the way, Len and Kit are friends again. Yay. Thrust knows he made a mistake and leaves. We see him uncommon Rider himself and a flashback starts. Thrust's real name is Brad Barrett, a racer that was called in because there was footage of him sabotaging another racer's bike. Because of this, Brad will never race again. Xaviax revealed that it was him who set Brad up. As a deal, Brad will join what Xaviax calls the Battle Club, if Brad wins, he gets his reputation back. Brad says no, but Xaviax summons a purple Kamen Rider to show the power that Brad can have. This is Kamen Rider Strike, Xaviax's second-hand man. I absolutely love Strike suit. It's shiny, and the Cobra motif is perfect for a snake like him. Brad is convinced and accepts Xaviax's offer. Maya goes back to the bookstore where JTC himself, James, waits for her. James shows Maya pictures of a pink Kamen Rider. 
This writer has been patrolling their city for the last month and became a bit of a local hero. He's known as the Hero of Gramercy Heights, named after the city this takes place in. James leaves the bookstore and tells Xaviax that everything has been set for their plan. The next morning, Brad tries to look for Xaviax but instead runs into Drew. Drew confirms what Kit said about Xaviax and Drew offers to be an ally so they can vent Wing Knight and Xaviax. Brad is fed up with everyone telling him something different so he walks away with Drew yelling out, You're not gonna make it out there without somebody watching your back! They're gonna vent you! A genuine criticism I hear about Dragonite is the acting, which is something I have to agree with. The acting can be pretty spotty at times, but the scene with Drew yelling out to Brad feels genuine, despite saying something as weird as being vented. Maya, Trent, and Lacey go to a park to set up a trap. Trent is wearing a monster costume and pretends to attack Lacey so that the pink Kamen Rider can arrive to help. But a real monster appears along with the Rider and Kit. The pink Rider is Kamen Rider Sting. His suit is alright. You can tell it's a Stingray and that extends to his weapon. It's not one of my favorite suits, but it's fine enough. Besides, real men wear pink. After they defeat the monster, Sting says that Kid is under arrest by the order of the United States government. In a flashback, a young man named Chris Ramirez isn't allowed to be part of the Marines because he has asthma. His father is angry because everyone in the Ramirez family has been a Marine. Chris sits alone when Xaviax has him an advent deck, saying that Chris will be able to fight aliens from another world and serve his country. Chris accepts. Kid and Chris son morph and chase after Brad and Len who are fighting close by. Len was able to overtake Brad and is about to go for a final blow, but Len hesitates, causing Brad to escape. At Xaviax's fortress, Drew says that he's been trying to get riders together to build up their army, but Xaviax knows that Drew is planning on betraying him. Drew is showing a clip show of how he is being traitorous, so Xaviax goes into his monster form. We've seen his monster form a few times, but seeing it like this in the dark makes it much more menacing. I like the suit, although the helmet kind of looks like a quirky, squished bat. I can get behind this being the general of a huge army. As he escapes, Drew wonders how he got into this mess in the first place. Drew used to be a con man that would sell junk. One day he almost got busted, so Xaviax offered Drew, quite literally, the world. And that was enough for him. JTC, also known as James, catches up with Drew and pulls out a purple advent deck with the symbol of a snake. Len and Brad have been fighting again, so Kit and Chris eventually find them, with James and Drew drawing their own fight closer. Drew unleashes an all-out attack that decimates the building they were fighting in. Everyone is in a weakened state, so James takes the chance to use a final vent on Brad Barrett. The once humble man who just wanted a way out is now gone. In a way, it's a bit of a blessing as Chris now sees how dangerous the situation is and finally becomes an ally to Len and Kit. Remember when Maya, Trent, and Lacey filmed their monster thing to trap Kamen Rider Sting? Well, it bit Maya in the butt as she's now fired from the journal site she was working for. Michelle Walsh, a famous journalist that I mentioned once, saw Maya at the park and believed Maya was fabricating all the abduction stories, so Michelle was the one that got Maya fired. Meanwhile, Drew and James end up in their own battle since Drew isn't off the hook just yet. Their fight escalates and James is able to successfully land the final vent on Drew. James mocks him for not siding with Xaviax and for always failing. With that, Drew gets sent to the Advent Void. Len gets a feeling that Drew has just been vented. I'm amazed that the adaptation can still have twists like this. In Kamen Rider Ryuki, Drew's counterpart lasted quite a long time, so it's surprising to see that Torek lasts not even half the season. It's at least interesting to those who already saw Ryuki and expected Torek to have the same lifespan. Well, it's also a decision that will come back to bite them later. Kit, Len, and Maya tell Chris everything. Xaviax, the monsters, Ventara, and the other writers. In a clip show. But it's not a bad clip show. There's still a decent amount of original footage that gives just a little bit more insight on how the characters felt during these events. The clip show is good enough to bring people up to speed, but like a majority of clip shows, you can skip it because you know it's here to save money and pad out the season. Unfortunately, it won't be the last. Kid asks questions that most of us were probably wondering. If the people of Antara and Earth are twins, shouldn't Len be able to find them faster? Len knows what they look like, but they're different people on Earth with different occupations and identities, so Kit gets the idea that JTC could help them find the Earth Riders. Len is surprised anyone would know about the Riders, so he wants to talk to JTC. Neither of them know who JTC really is. While all this is happening, James and Xaviax find their next Riders, Albert and Danny Cho, otherwise known as just the Brothers Cho. They're simple thieves that are happy with cash and advent decks. Their greedy motive is a little bland, but they have personality. Kit, Len, and Chris hang out for a bit when Kit asks if Len did anything else besides being a writer. Len explains that he was never anything else besides a common writer. He was chosen at a young age, which was an honor in Ventara. Kit tells a story about how he almost got kicked out of high school for riding a motorcycle during the middle of a football game. They all laugh, but Chris needs some time alone. Chris's dad wouldn't find it humorous. If Chris ever did anything like that, it would bring shame to his entire family. 
It's bad enough that he can't be a marine due to his asthma. Chris recently got a letter from his doctor saying that any activity he does is extremely dangerous for his health, and he feels like a burden because of this condition. Len talks to Kit one on one. Len wants Kit to replace the Ventaran Dragon Knight. Kit is honored, but Len stops him as there's a condition of being a Ventaran Rider. The common riders stay in suspended animation until they're needed, which is once every 12 years. What they're needed for, I, I don't know, maybe they're called for cleaning duty or something. Kit says he needs some time to think about it, which Len understands. Len leaves, but is stopped by the Cho brothers, who harass Len and prepare for a fight, but Len takes away their advent decks and calls them amateurs. Fun fact that most of you probably already know, this show won a daytime Emmy award for outstanding stunt coordination. This scene proves how well deserving Dragonite is for winning. There's a lot going on between fight choreography, wireworks, other stunts, and so on. It's great. Len is able to overtake the brothers easily and leaves. Kit goes to the hospital and notices that his dad is missing, with the only thing left behind being a logo of a snake. Chris sits alone, writing in a notebook, when James says that there's a way to cure Chris's asthma. Chris doesn't know who he is, so James pulls out his Kamen Rider Strike Advent deck. James offers a deal. Take out Wing Knight and Chris will be cured. To which Chris asks if James knows what Semper Fidelis means. It's the motto for the US Marines, which means always faithful. The two transform, but Chris escapes. Kid and crew regroup at the bookstore. Frank was kidnapped by Conrad Strike, and two new riders are on their way since they followed Len. The Cho brothers appear, ready for a fight. Albert Cho transforms inside the store and causes a mess. Albert is Kamen Rider Spear and Danny is Kamen Rider Axe. Spear, the brown gazelle-like rider, used to be one of my least favorite suits, but it grew on me out of most of the riders. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I love the helmet, even though the vest look isn't really doing it for me. Axe, the white tiger, is a little average. I like the blue and white color scheme, but other than that, it's definitely a tiger. The new riders prove to be capable fighters with their armor on as Len is dealt heavy damage. Danny is stopping Kit from getting any closer and Chris being knocked down by Kamen Rider Strike. Strike readies his final vent and aims for Len, but at the last second, Chris covers him. Chris starts to see himself disappear and say his final words. Semper Fi. Len and Kit stand alone, remembering a pact they made with Chris. For Ventara and Earth. So throughout the show, Lacey has been unsupportive of Amaya because Lacey didn't believe in monsters and common writers, but she did see Albert transform inside the bookstore. Lacey now believes Amaya has been telling the truth and regrets doubting her. Michelle Walsh notices her sitting alone, so Michelle says that she's able to help Maya if Lacey hacks into Maya's laptop with the USB. Being the idiot that she is, Lacey actually goes through with it and copies all of Maya's files with the USB. Maya got a call earlier from JTC saying that he knows where Kit's dad is, so Maya and Kit went out to meet him, leaving the store alone with Trent, which is how Lacey was able to go in so easily. Maya and Kit find Frank, but James steps out and shows them the Kamen Rider Strike deck. Maya realizes that she's been feeding into JTC's false friendship the entire time. James reveals that he just wants freedom to do what he wants. He was in prison at one time, but he was set free by Xaviax. And again, that's about it. James tries to make a deal, but Kid outright says no. The Cho brothers come out of the mirrors and prepare for a fight. The four transform. During the fight, Maya's able to escape with Kid's dad. If the scene with Len fighting the Cho brothers was Emmy-worthy, then this scene must have gotten so much more. It's 1 versus 3 and they use everything they can. The environment, the mirror surfaces, and even Ventar itself is used for some sneak attacks. Kid is able to push Danny and James out of the warehouse, leaving only Kid and Albert. Kid wants revenge for what they've done to Chris, so Kid gets ready for a final vent. Danny sees his brother disappear from the other side of the mirror and swears revenge. No matter what Xaviac says. Somewhere in the city, we see a couple of monsters jump out of a mirror, followed by a motorcycle. The woman riding the cycle steps out and transforms into Kamen Rider Siren. It's not terrible looking, but the suits of the season are starting to blend together to me. I like the swan motif and the helmet is nice, but everything else looks pretty standard. I'm not entirely sure how it could be more unique without giving it obvious female armor. Kid and Len talk on our rooftop. Kid asks if venting people gets any easier, but at this point, Len says Kid needs to figure out some things out for himself. They're both facing hardships, but at least they have each other. They hear mirror noise. Kid arrives on scene first and sees Siren fight Danny until Danny runs away. Then Siren fights Kit because she thinks that Kit is working for Xaviax. Len arrives in time and tells Siren to stop fighting. She demorphs and asks Len why he's protecting Xaviax's riders. Len is left confused, saying that Case is alive. Len and Siren, whose real name is Case, catch up on what's happened. Case helped Len escape Ventara, but Case was left behind. We also find out that she and Len are a couple, which seemed kind of weird since riders aren't suspended animation, which means that they will only see each other every 12 years. Love has no bounds, I guess. Michelle Walsh walks into a government building and gives a man a USB. The man sees everything about the common riders and tells Michelle to bring him Kit Taylor. 
Kid hears knocking at his apartment door and opens it to Michelle. She says that some people in Washington want to have a little chat with him, but Kid is suspicious after Michelle referred to him as Common Rider Dragon Knight. Kid isn't having any of it and walks out. He goes to the hospital and sees someone standing over his dad. It's Zaviax, and this is the first time they're meeting face to face. Zaviax wakes up Kit's dad and realizes that it was Zaviax who put Frank into a coma. It was Zaviax who led Kit to the Advent decks in the world of Antara. It almost seemed like Kit was the only writer that Zaviax didn't manipulate, but Zaviax got through Kit after all. Kit and his dad share a moment together, but it doesn't last long as Zaviax puts Frank back into a coma. Zaviax offers Kit one last deal. Get rid of Wing Knight to get his dad back. Kit goes to a park and remembers a time where he and his dad were playing catch. Kit says that there's a kid at school who's getting bullied so he wants the bully expelled. But Kit's dad says that the ends never justify the means. With this advice, Kit knows what to do. But Danny pushes him into Ventara and they fight. Danny seems to be winning but James arrives and wants to be the one to finish off Kit. James uses a final vent and aims directly for Danny, sending him to the Advent Void. Maya was able to find out that her computer was hacked so she had to delete everything, including five years of research, networking, and hard work with her blogs. Lacey asks why they're so scared of the government if they could possibly help with Ventara. Trent explains that the people who want to help aren't exactly with the government. Instead, Michelle's group works on the inside to cover up the truth by any means necessary. Filled with guilt, Lacey says that she is the one who gave Michelle the information. Kid and Len discuss what's going on. Kid was confused and didn't know what to do since Zavax had Kid under his strings the entire time. But since Kid thought about what his dad said, Kid is ready to take on Zavax. James tells Zavax that Danny has been vented and now they barely have any reinforcements left. Except Zavax has one rider that he's been holding back until needed. Common Rider Wrath is drained, like Kid's father, so it doesn't have any will of its own. Until Zavax steps in. Wrath is a fantastic suit and probably one of the best this show has to offer. It's so majestic and don't let that fool you, it has a lot of power. Kit goes to the hospital one more time to say bye to his dad since Kit doesn't know if he's going to come back. However, some men in business suits grab Kit. Maya was trying to go off the radar so Michelle wouldn't find her, leaving the bookstore in the hands of Lacey and Trent, which isn't exactly a good idea. Common Rider Wrath and Strike arrive to take them hostage, but Len and Case come just in time. Len knows that it's Zaviax himself controlling Wrath. Lacey and Trent escape, but Wrath proves to be too strong for just Len and Case to fight. Kid wakes up in a jail cell, yelling out that he's on their side, but who exactly are they? Maya returns to the bookstore in ruins and Michelle is there waiting for her. Michelle says that she works for the No Men, and she's been undercover as a reporter to seal as much of the truth as she can about Ventara. After some time, Trent and a couple of his hacker buddies are able to locate the No Man's headquarters so they rally the information on Len and Case, with Maya already on her way to save Kit. Kit gets interrogated by Michelle in a rather entertaining scene. Taylor, what are you doing? Thanks for the drink. Len, Case, and Maya were at the No Man's HQ, but they know Kit escaped because an alarm sounded. Everyone regroups at the bookstore, but they can't stay long as the No Men begin to break in. As Kit and friends escape, Case says that she has something for Len and Kit. She couldn't get them all, but since fights are starting to escalate, Case feels that they're needed now. Survive mode cards. They're the strongest cards that the writers have, but they can't be used for too long because they use too much energy. The cards are for emergencies only, but going after Zavax seems kind of like a big emergency. James comes out of a car's reflective surface with a surprise attack and steals the Common Rider Thrust and Strike Advent decks. Len and Kit go after him, but Thrust Advent Beast attacks James. Each rider can only control one Advent Beast at a time, but Zavax was able to power up James's deck. So now he can control multiple beasts with multiple contract cards. Len, Kit, and James continue fighting until James summons Sting's Advent Beast. James uses a polymerization to fusion summon a stronger monster. All this time, Case was fighting Zavax close by on her own, but she can't handle him. Seeing his chance to attack, James knocks out his opponent and aims a final vent towards Case. Len yells out for her, but it's too late. Kit says they'll defeat Common Rider Strike, but Len says no. He pulls out his survive card and says that he alone will take out Strike. Kit tried to fight James himself to no avail, so Len helps just in time, but now he's going to use the last of what Case gave him. Len uses the card and becomes Kamen Rider Wing Knight Survive. What a gorgeous looking suit. My personal favorite from this season. Wing Knight Survive is exactly what I look for in a power-up. Strong looking with a good color scheme. You can tell he has a lot of power just by looking at that bigger armor. Len is able to easily fight James, but the two of them end it by summoning their advent beasts and go for one final attack. It seems Len is okay, but James gets sent to the advent void. This fight may be over, but now Zavax, still in the wrath armor, wants to fight. However, this time, it's Kit's turn to power up and to Kamen Rider Dragon Knight survive. We go from one of the best looking suits in the show to one that... 
I personally don't like. The helmet looks cool, but everything else looks like one big blob. But that's just my opinion. The three fight for a long while, with Kit ending up being knocked out and Zavax preparing a final attack to finish off Len. Kit wakes up and uses his own attack to stop Xaviax. Xaviax and Kit both fall, but Kit appears to be fine. Then Kit slowly starts disappearing. There's nothing Len can do. Our main character, Kit Taylor, is gone. Wrath also starts to disappear, but Xaviax is left behind. Wrath was just a puppet, a shell that Xaviax used, so he turned out fine. Before leaving, Xaviax takes Kit's advent deck. Len is left alone as Maya, her friends, and the Nomen arrive. They mourn the loss of Kit, but their mourning is cut short as Michelle shows Len a picture. Len immediately wants Michelle to take him to whatever, or whoever, is in the picture. Len is shown a tube that holds armor. It belongs to someone called the Advent Master. Len pulls out his deck and is able to wake up the armor. The Advent Master unmorphs and reveals a man named Ubulon, someone that Len is very happy to see. Ubulon explains that the last thing he remembers is a battle between him and Xaviax that ended with the two venting each other at the same time. Apparently, the government found Ubulon 61 years ago in Roswell, New Mexico, but they couldn't wake him up so Ubulon was frozen solid until Len woke him up with the deck. Len tells Ubilon that the Ventaran Dragon Knight, named Adam, betrayed the Riders and helped revive Xaviax. A Nomad agent hands Ubilon some sort of machine. It's a teleportation beacon that could help defeat Xaviax, if it wasn't already being used by him. Somewhere far away, we see Kit having fun with a girl on a carousel ride, but Xaviax is there, watching. This is actually Adam, the traitor that sold out his entire planet for a girl. He wasn't supposed to see Xaviax again, but Xaviax is back with a new deal, defeat Len or never see his girlfriend again. Len has been collecting all the advent decks so he can give them to Ubilon, who is going to be away for a while since he's going to bring the riders back. The advent void used to be a fail-safe plan. If riders were badly hurt, they would be sent to the void to be healed in pods, but since Ubilon hasn't been here for over 60 years, the riders had no way out of the void. Before he leaves, Ubilon asks Maya if she would like to be a rider. The decks only work for those who had a DNA match, but Ubilon was the one who made them in the first place so he can decide who the decks work for. Maya happily says yes and accepts the deck. She's also able to have all of Siren's experience by touching palms with Ubilon. With that, he travels into the Advent Void. Later on, Len explains to Maya that the riders were chosen at a young age. Adam was the youngest of them, which means he wasn't exactly ready to be a rider for the rest of his life. Xaviax knew his weakness, which was a girl named Sarah. At the Nomen HQ, it seems like Drew, Danny, and James have returned, but in actuality, it's the original Ventaran Common Riders, Chance, Price, and Hunt. I already forgot their names. Anyway, Len is happy that they're back, but Maya still seems James and his Ventaran counterpart. The riders are brought up to speed. The plan to defeat Xavax is to find his teleportation beacons and upload a virus to them in order to bring everyone back from Ventara, while also stopping Xavax from using them. Len and his team find one of Xavax's devices, but they run into a monster. They all transform, but a rider they've never seen before shows up. Common Rider Onyx is pretty much a dark dragon knight. I think it looks pretty cool, especially when the eyes glow. It's a terrifying suit that is being used by Kit, who was given the Onyx deck after Ubilon rescued him in case. Maya has been fighting mere monsters when Adam showed up. Maya knows that he's not an ally, then Kit arrives. Kit and Adam argue until the two start fighting. Kit is the better fighter, but Ubilon shows up in time to stop Kit from doing anything harmful. Adam says he wants to fight against Xaviax, so Ubilon takes him to the HQ. Adam wants to tell his side of the story. He fell in love with Sarah, so she didn't want Adam to go, but Adam had no choice. He has to go into hibernation for 12 years with the rest of the writers. On his day before suspended animation, the disguised Xaviax offered him what he wanted the most. Adam thought the other writers also wanted out of their duties, so Adam took their advent decks. He thought he was doing the right thing, but ended up being tricked by Xaviax, just like everyone else. More of Xaviax's beacons are found, so Ubilon puts Adam on Len's team to test his loyalty. Len's team finds a transmitter, but they're attacked by a monster. Adam tells Len to give him the hard drive with the virus on it. Len says no at first, but he has no choice as Len needs to stay and fight. Adam goes towards the transmitter while Xaviax waits for him. Xaviax shuts down the beacon temporarily and takes the drive to make an antivirus. No one else was around, so Len's team starts trusting Adam. Filled with guilt after lying to his friend and after having a talk with Kit, Adam now wants to betray Xaviax, but Xaviax is already aware of Adam's intention, so he disguises himself as Ubilon. Xaviax mocks Adam by saying that Kit gave up his own dad to fight for Ventara, while Adam gave up his whole planet for a girl. Ouch. The two transform, and begin to fight. Now that we see the Advent Master suit more clearly, I'll say my quick thoughts on our final suit. I think it looks pretty cool. Strange, but cool. 
That's not supposed to have the uniform look of the other riders, so it stands out more. The helmet looks a little squished to me, but I like the details and bolts on the body. On a quick tangent, it's weird how he doesn't count as a real common rider. He doesn't count as a rider either in Ryuki, but there was a simple explanation for that. Here, I don't know. He still says common rider to transform, but whatever, I guess I'm overthinking it. During their fight, Adam says he's back with the common riders for good, still not knowing that Xavax is in disguise. Then, Xaviax walks away. Kid and Maya talk to their real Yubilon. They ask how Ventara is more technologically advanced than Earth, and how Yubilon made everything that has to do with the Kamen Riders. Yubilon explains that he actually isn't from Ventara. He's an alien from another planet, called Karsh. Yubilon was a weapons developer for Xaviax, who was a general for the Karshan army. With Yubilon's technology, Xaviax was able to win a war on Karsh, but it became a wasteland as a result. Yubilon was sent to search for slaves to rebuild Karsh, which led him to Ventara, but he became ill, so a Ventaran family nursed him back to health. Their act of kindness made Yubilon realize that he can't help Xaviax anymore. Yubilon needed to fight back, so he created the Common Riders with the help of Ventara's greatest warriors. The final beacon has been found, so Len and Adam are sent to shut it down. Len does so, but Adam begins to attack. They both fight to the point where they both use survive cards in a rather intense scene. Kid and Case arrive in time to hear Adam confess to how he helped Xaviax again. The beacons aren't actually down because Xaviax made an antivirus, with the help of Adam. Everyone at HQ notices that the transmitters are back on and are starting to load. Xaviax's plan is almost complete. Then we get into our finale episodes, for Ventara and Earth Part 1 and 2. Adam confesses his story to the writers and says that Yubilon attacked him, but Kit believes it was just Xaviax in disguise. Yubilon has a plan that requires the use of a new card called the Link Vent card. With all 13 riders, they can use the cards to combine their final vents together and defeat Xaviax. First, they need to get inside Xaviax's fortress by sending in Maya and Trent, because there's a force field that stops the riders from getting in. The riders will distract Xaviax on enough for Maya and Trent to get inside. The rest of this episode is pretty much nothing but action as the riders fight off monster after monster. And it's glorious, made even better considering a lot of it is original footage. Maya, Trent, Kid, and Case make it to the fortress. It's funny how we usually see the fortress in a dark, menacing way, but it looks to be just outside of a parking lot. Maya and Trent are able to get the riders inside the fortress by carrying around a big roll of reflective paper. Or foil, I can't really tell what it is. Yubilon gets inside the fortress and faces Xaviax alone. Xaviax mocks him for betraying their planet, but Yubilon says that their time is over, and they need to leave the other worlds alone. The two transform and fight one last time. Xaviax is about to finish off Yubilon until Kid and Adam use their strike vents in this really cool looking move. The riders try to fight Xaviax, but he seems to be able to handle them no problem. Except that the riders were just trying to distract Xaviax long enough for Yubilon to summon the rest of the riders. All 13 riders stand around Xaviax and use the Link Vent card to finish off Xaviax for good. But not before we get a quick glimpse of his real form. The common riders aren't common rider themselves, and we get to see familiar faces. They all celebrate, although Yubilon says that they're not done yet. The riders need to help get all the Ventarans back to their own planet. Adam is ready, but he needs to do something first. Adam goes into Sarah's prison and explains everything that's happened. In our final episode, A Dragon's Tale, we see that the bookstore has relocated into a bigger store that definitely isn't Barnes & Noble's, and Maya recaps in another clip show. Yeah, the final episode is another boring clip show. At least until the last third of the episode. Maya explains that Yubilon and the Riders were able to return all the Ventarans back to their planet. Yubilon then returned all the Earth Riders back to normal, healing them and wiping away their memories of being Riders. Chris was even cured of his asthma. You want to cure something else, Yubilon? Like, I'm pretty sure there are other things in the world that need to be cured. Oh, okay, whatever. Adam gave up being a rider to start a new life with Sarah. In his place, Kit became the new Dragon Knight. Trent became a no-man because of his hacking skills, and Lacey now works with Maya in the bookstore, which includes a fashion section. I'm sure that'll do well. Maya wasn't allowed to write a story of the common writer, so instead, she wrote it as a fiction for kids. It seems like the writers don't need to go back to sleep every 12 years anymore, so Maya is able to get a date with Ventar and James. Don't worry, they actually had a bit of romance a while ago, so this didn't come out of nowhere. And Kid's dad is back to normal. However, this doesn't mean that threats no longer exist, because the common writers are still called upon whenever they're needed. Common Rider Dragonite has quite the history behind it, no pun intended. The failure of Saban's masked rider ensured we'd never see Kamen Rider again in America. Then Dragonite came along, and unfortunately, it wasn't a mass success. Don't get me wrong, it was still very well received, won an Emmy, and had a lot going for it even after the show ended. However, one thing led to another and Kamen Rider was just dropped entirely. 
There was a movie plan, but Atlas Entertainment wanted to work on a second season of Dragonite instead, and that was the last we heard of it. Saban did trademark the name Power Rider years later, which most assumed was going to be another adaptation, but then it got dropped again. We never saw anything from it besides a couple of fan-made photoshops. I'm guessing Kamen Rider is cursed to not do well in the West. Which is weird, because Dragonite was aired in Japan with the dub. And ironically, it became more popular than Ryuki. In fact, it was so popular that it even got a continuation in the form of a novel. One thing that ruined Dragonite's chances of continuing is where it aired. 4Kids is infamous for butchering the anime that they dub. Dragonite was shown on the CW 4Kids and, well, let's just say that 4Kids cancelled it and didn't even want to air the final few episodes on TV. I couldn't find any official information on this, but apparently the Wang brothers were in talks with Disney and Jason David Frank, who would possibly be in the Kamen Rider adaptation, but of course it didn't happen and JDF returned for Dino Thunder. Honestly, if Dragonite was aired on Disney, then it could have gotten a bigger following, but we can't change the past now. Would it have been better if the Wang brothers chose to adapt something other than Ryuki? Well, rumor has it that Kamen Rider Blade, Fize, and Kabuto were considered because they were also cheap to get the rights for, and Kabuto had many writers. In my personal opinion, I'd say that history would repeat itself no matter what got chosen to be adapted. The seasons I mentioned had a very similar tone to Ryuki, more or less, please don't hate me on that. They're a bit dark with random silly moments scattered throughout. Except Blade, that's very well known for its memes, which probably wouldn't be adapted anyway. I mentioned in the beginning that the Wang brothers wanted Dragonite to be as far away from Saban's Masked Rider as possible. That includes changing the transformation phrase. Here's a mini rant I wanted to get into. To transform into a Kamen Rider, the user says, Kamen Rider. For some very strange reason, the phrase alone is enough for people to call Dragonite absolute trash. That's quite the purest thing to say that I don't quite understand. I admit, I'd prefer if the phrase was just transform or let's ride, but come on, it's not something to worry about. A lot of characters say, let's ride pretty often, so why not make that the phrase? Okay, I've talked way too much about a simple phrase that I needed to. So enough about what could have happened, let's talk about what we actually got. A lot of people say that Dragonite is just a watered down Americanized Ryuki. Well, I wouldn't exactly say watered down. I'd say that Dragonite is just doing what an adaptation is supposed to do, which is knowing the audience while respecting the source material. Dragonite's plot is good versus evil from the get-go. It's a story that's easy to follow and one that most people who watch Power Rangers grew up on. Yes, there are easily distinguishable good guys and bad guys, but even those characters have gray areas. There were a couple of instances where Kit dreamt about venting Len and Case because he thought it would be the right thing to do. There was a time where Drew truly wanted to be Kit's ally and defeat Xaviax, but Drew was already in the middle of Xaviax's war. A lot of characters have inner turmoils that will make the show a lot deeper than you think, despite having a simple plot. To go hand in hand with the story, the show does answer a lot of questions in universe, such as why Xaviax needs specific people instead of getting the toughest people on the planet, or how the Advent Void works. Some things are explained multiple times throughout the season in case you forgot, so it's good to have a bit of world building. But what doesn't get explained is how Ventara and Earth are connected, which bothers me the most. Ventara is a separate planet, so how can writers go back and forth? I'm guessing that the Advent decks kind of act like a pass to get into Ventara, but that doesn't explain how monsters and other humans can go in. Maybe the teleport beacons are used, but they've been off the whole time. You know what, let's just move on. A simple premise isn't a bad thing, and Dragonite did well enough with it. The problem is how it became a completely different show in the last third. Or more specifically, the last 10 episodes. We started with Len and Kit fighting other writers to get to Xaviax, but then we delve into alien conspiracies with government involvement. Like, what? That's not to say it didn't come out of nowhere, because Ventara being another planet and the no man tracking Maya was brought up plenty of times before they became part of the central plot. It's just jarring for a superhero show to feel like it goes from 0 to 100 so fast. Again, the story is simple, but it's easy to follow, and it's enjoyable as a result. But what the story lacks in depth is made up, and more, with the characters. Kit Taylor is an okay protagonist. He wants to do what's right, but he also has personal dilemmas. It's not common to have our main hero think about betraying his friends while having a good reason for it. Kit's only family is his dad, so I think it would be natural for someone to fight for what's left. Kit later realized that the ends don't always justify the means, so he mans up and joins the Kamen Riders for the greater good. He often saw his dad speak to him, so Kit would take whatever he said to heart. So in a way, Frank helped Kit know his place in the world. Frank also wouldn't hold anything back if Kit was being stupid. At one point, Frank told Kit that he had to stop worrying so much about others and worry about himself for a change. 
Frank was telling Kit that it's okay to want something, but there needs to be a balance. I like how Kit is generally easygoing and only fights when he needs to, although I did find it annoying how Kit did spew out the occasional generic lines of, we gotta do what's right. One more thing I want to bring up is how Kit became two writers, Dragonite and Onyx. In Ryuki, Onyx's counterpart was an evil writer that was used at the final boss of a movie. In Kit's dreams, he used Onyx to vent Len and Case, but in the real world, Kit used the armor to fight for good. It's a nice juxtaposition that I find to be very interesting. I could say the same thing about Adam, but to a much, much, much lesser extent. Adam is alright, I just wish there was time to flesh him out more. The pace picked up pretty quickly towards the end so Adam didn't have a lot of time to do anything. Adam is Adam and is a good enough character to join the cast I guess. Len, our next main writer, is pretty cool. His mission is to gather the admin Dax and defeat Xaviax. Len's friends were gone along with his significant others so it made sense for Len to act cold. He's in a war after all. He opened up a bit later but was still stern and called out others for their ignorance. Len has his own inner noise to deal with so babysitting a new writer probably wasn't on his plan. I like how Len talks to himself in a mirror to try to get things right. When Len met Chris for the first time, Len kept going back and forth on whether it was right for Chris to join in their war. Len even went as far as saying that he should just fend Chris now since Chris might end up being a burden. It's a bit dark but very enjoyable, especially for a kid's show. Len is great and is one of my favorite characters of the show. This is going to be a bit early but I need to bring up Case to talk about my next point. Case is also a cool character. She's considered to be one of the greatest warriors on Ventara, next to Len, and it shows. Case is tough and like Len isn't afraid to call out someone. She tells Kit to his face that she doesn't believe he's a real common writer. I'm not saying she's a female Len because Case does have her own personality and ambitions. Maya gave back the siren deck and talked about how she'd rather be a journalist and fight for the truth. Hearing that made Case a bit more humble but being a writer is the path she's chosen and it's one that she's okay with. Although she shows up halfway through the season, Case doesn't end up being a background character. She makes an impact to Len and Kit's war as a new ally. The team of Len, Kit and eventually Case is great. They all work off each other and share the same common goal. This might be a weird way to put it, but I think of them as their own family. Kit and Len are able to share their ideals while also being able to one-up each other in order to push themselves. Len and Case are the couple that clearly love each other but know that there's still a war going on that they need to focus on first. Case and Kit butt heads a couple of times but that's only for Kit to be a stronger warrior. I love their teamwork but let's not forget about Chris. Common Rider Sting, or better known as Chris Ramirez, is another one of my favorites. Much like Kit, Chris just wants to do the right thing and serve his country. Chris has a bit more inner turmoil since he ended up playing into Zavax's hands, which must have hurt Chris finding out that he's been fighting for the wrong cause his entire time. He does try to make up for it by joining Len and Kit, but he still feels the need to do better. We do get two Chris-focused episodes that I find to be very enjoyable. I especially like how the motto of Semper Fi is used to show a sign of loyalty. It fits Chris and he was on a show for a right amount of time. The only other writer who gets a lot of screen time is Common Rider Strike. James, JTC, Ventaran James, yeah I guess a little confusing. James is kind of a bad character. His motive is, um, he works with Xaviax to, um, he fights the other writers because he's a jerk? At the very least, James was able to have a few people play into the palms of his hands for like a good minute. He got a lot of screen time because the Ryuki counterpart also had a lot of screen time. Ventara and James had an actual personality and did start to grow a relationship with Maya. Maya didn't even want to look at him at first because she was reminded of James, but the two soon learned to accept each other and started to get together by the end. It's a shame James is one note because the rest of the writers are also pretty one note. Incisor, Torque, Camo, Axe, Spear, Thrust, and Wrath don't have much in terms of personality. Most of them have one greedy motive and then they disappear before they get any real character. Same thing goes for the Ventaran Riders, except Wrath, he was literally just a puppet for Xaviax. Thrust and Axe get a couple of extra stories such as Thrust wanting to get out of the war after he finds out who Xaviax is, or Axe wanting to avenge his brother, but again, they don't last long. I mean, they at least do their job as being cannon fodder with a bit of backstory. Eh. Ubulon, the admin master, is my third favorite character. He's the writer leader and he acts like it, giving advice to Len and Kit while being able to hold his own in a fight. Still salty doesn't count as a real common writer though. As for the side characters, my Trent and Lacey, they're fine. Trent and Lacey don't overstay their welcome and are never seen on screen for too long. They're used for comic relief as well as being the outsiders at the common writer events. They help when they can, but Lacey is the only character that bothers me honestly. 
Lacey was stupid enough to allow the government to intervene with the riders, all for her friend. Okay, that's cool, she wants to help Maya, but Lacey is fully willing to hack into Maya's computer for the government. Like, no, don't do that. Even an idiot would think that's a bad idea. Maya herself is a decent character. She becomes a damsel in distress a couple of times, then she becomes a common rider. Quite a change there, and it could show a bit of growth. Except Maya's pretty stagnant for the most part. She doesn't have any big character changing arcs, but she doesn't need one. She helps Kit a lot, I'd say maybe even more than Len does, since Maya is able to arrange a meeting between James and Kit. She's able to help find Zavax's beacons alone. She helps Kit by setting up a trap to find Chris. I think Maya is a good support. Michelle and the No Man. Yup. Our main villain Zaviax is definitely the big bad of the show that I grew to enjoy. I think he does more than an average Power Ranger villain as Zaviax is actually frightening and does do things on his own. He becomes a common Rider and is able to go hand to hand against Len and Kid at their most powerful. Although Zaviax does have a few stupid moments like having his own Riders get vented because Zaviax didn't want them anymore. Still, I could see this guy being the general of an army. All in all, the main cast is great and everyone else does their job just fine. I've been using the words alright and okay and decent a lot for the analysis, and that sums up what I think about the show. Common Rider Dragon Knight is alright. It does no harm and is a fun ride from beginning to end, which is more than what I could say for Ryuki, but low blows aside. I can recommend Dragon Knight to those who want to get into Common Rider because it still does have a lot of what makes for a good Common Rider season. Memorable characters, a good story, and unbelievable action. While I wouldn't say that Dragon Knight is one of my favorite seasons, I would say that I appreciate what it's done for the fans of the shows, and for bringing in even more fans, such as myself. I hope purists won't sway you from not watching Dragon Knight because it is able to stand on its own without being compared to the original source material, and overall, it's a show that anyone can enjoy including you. With all that being said, join me next time when we open our eyes for Common Rider Fies.